Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Olya Kors. I'm the pediatric nephrologist here at uh, LPCH in Stanford and I'm here on behalf of our Grand Rounds Committee. Um, it, to start, I want to recognize that Stanford University um, land acknowledgement that we um, um, are on the ancestral land of the Moakma Ohlone tribe. Um, also, for your attendance, please, uh, feel free to use the code on the left um, and uh, text um, uh, with the code to the number so that you can get credit for today's session. And then um, remember to fill out our evaluations and potentially get uh, uh, CME credit um, for, for this session. Um, moving forward, um, I uh, want to present today um, Dr. Jennifer Romano coming from University of Michigan um, and talking about um, uh, on the topic of plumber's perspective on leaky pipes, enhancing equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I will let our cardiology faculty introduce our speaker um, later in more detail. But to draw your attention to upcoming events, um, on May 5th, we'll have Dr. Headland from Harvard Medical School speaking on how the pediatric workforce can address the nation's overdose crisis. Next, on May 12th, we will have our former acting California Surgeon General, Dr. Bushan, um, uh, join us for Stanford Medicine's sixth annual diversity and inclusion forum. And then on uh, May 19th, in recognition of um, Asian American and Pacific Island Heritage Month, we will have Dr. Vicky and uh, talk about outcomes of pediatric liver transplant in 2023, something for everyone to care about. And back to today's session. Um, Dr. Romano uh, will be talking about a female surgeon's perspective on the challenges that may contribute to the lack of equity of women and underrepresented minorities that have specialties and leadership positions. And I will let our faculty from cardiology, Associate Professor Becca Kearney and uh, Magna Patel introduce our speaker. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jenna Romano. Um, our speaker for today, she is the Herbert Sloan a professor in pediatric uh, congenital heart surgery at Mott Children's Hospital in the University of Michigan. She is the incoming SDS president and an internationally recognized expert in high-risk um, hypoplastic left heart palliation, including the hybrid procedure where she gave an excellent talk yesterday to our faculty group. And she also is an excellent mentor, particularly for women and an expert in the uh, attrition of women and minorities from our field. And so fortunately for us, she was convinced uh, not to go into veterinary medicine and, uh, and for our field. And so she will speak to us today about uh, the plumber's perspective on leaky pipeline, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our field. Dr. Romano, thank you. All righty, let's get these slides to work. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. I've had a wonderful uh, day and early morning so far in Palo Alto. Um, I met with a lot of really fun women yesterday and heard some great things about the program. And I, so this place has a great energy. I really have enjoyed it. So whenever you're a surgeon coming to talk across disciplines, kind of coming up with a topic that will speak to everyone can sometimes be challenging. I don't think a lot of you want to hear about cardioplegia or something like that. So um, I thought this would be something that hopefully touches across all different specialties and all different areas of medicine. So I have uh, real no positive financial disclosures, unfortunately. I have been in the field of medicine for almost three decades, so I certainly have a significant lived experience. And for those of you who know Somia Balasubramanian, who used to be here, I thank her for sharing her slides that specifically speak to the pediatric uh, portion of medicine um, and her tremendous support. She actually leads our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives in our congenital heart center, and she's been, has really imparted some amazing change. I wanna start with, for those of you who know much about the thoracic surgical world, we had our own kind of DEI crisis in January when we had a bit of a difficult presidential address. Um, that really showed that we have a lot of blind spots. And so uh, in this picture on the left is the current STS president, Tom McGilvery, and sharing a conversation he had with uh, James Pogue, who is our DEI consultant that we've hired. And the only reason I show this picture is what's above James's head, and he really brings this to light. These are uncomfortable conversations. Difficult, meaningful, and important conversations usually are uncomfortable. You have to push through that, and a lot of it is just about hearing everybody's perspective and having a conversation so we can all move forward. So I started doing these talks uh, just pre-pandemic. I was invited to be the Nina Star Braunwald visiting professor at the Brigham. And so I started reading a lot about Nina Star Braunwald. I think it's a name that uh, most people have heard of. And she was really a pioneer in her field. 
she was the first woman to implant a mechanical mitral valve. She actually made it herself using her sewing machine at home and really was a luminary in her field. But she also was an amazing mother and spouse. She was married to Eugene Broadmalt, who clearly has had a meteoric career in cardiology, and they had three beautiful kids and had a really lovely life in Boston. And, you know, it's one of those things that she had this very polarized life where, you know, she was really this amazing cardiac surgeon, first female to be board certified. And she was really tremendously dedicated to her patients. She had a, an amazing career that started in D.C. and continued when she was out in California for a period of time. And then she followed Eugene back to Boston, where her career really came to a screeching halt. She was hired as a lecturer and never was advanced to the tenure track. She was never recognized by her own institution, despite the fact that she was highlighted in Life magazine for her achievements, Time magazine, and received many national recognitions, but was never recognized locally. But, you know, I had the opportunity during this um, professorship to have dinner with Eugene and her three children, who really shared lovely stories of how important her career was and her family was to her. And as part of her legacy, Eugene has created the um, Unistar Braunwald Early Career Development Award and has invested millions of dollars because of the pain that he feels about how marginalized her career was as a result of his switch to a different institution. And really, he has so much respect for her. It's beautiful. And I was one of the recipients, and in this picture are many of the leading women in cardiothoracic surgery today who received that award thanks to uh, Nina's legacy. So why are we gonna talk about this today? I mean, there's tons of research that clearly shows that having diversity in healthcare makes a difference, increases comfort level, boosts activity, enhances our understanding of each other. We're more innovative with diverse teams. There's increased trust within diverse teams. We retain people better, we retain talent. Better communication, reduced health disparities for our patients who need to see a healthcare workforce that looks like them, and overall increased engagement. And when we don't have disparity in work fields, that's when we start seeing exhaustion, negativity, inefficiency, and most importantly, burnout, which is really pervasive in the field of medicine. And again, there's lots of data that shows that having female physicians underrepresented by more minority members within the medical profession improves health outcomes and improves the uh, well-being of the workforce. So the bottom line is equity is not a zero-sum game. When one wins, we all are going to win. And this slide, I think, does a nice job of really showing there's a difference between equality and equity. And what we're really interested in equity and in everybody getting an opportunity with their skills and their talents to be able to perform and participate. There's a lot of areas where we can target for diversity and equity and inclusion. Some of the simplest things when you just simply look at authorship of manuscripts, the number of women that are granted authorship or ability to publish, who's invited to speak at national meetings as well as local meetings, funding for research advancement and promotion amongst academic ranks, equity amongst earnings, and the, and the most important thing is to have equal respect and status within the field. So I'm gonna to touch on uh, several different areas. Uh, the current state, both in medicine in general, pediatrics, pediatric cardiology and surgery, compensation, promotion, some challenges in the workplace, work-life integration, and the path forward. So I think many people have seen a lot of these slides. I actually went to medical, started in medical school in 1996, which was the year, the first year that women were 51% of the class at the Harvard Medical School. And that was a really long time ago and we still haven't made much progress from there. But as we know that over time, the uh, number of women has increased and has been pretty much at parity or above 50% since 2019. But when you look at actually women in the medical profession, the green line are those in medical school and the blue line are those who are actually active physicians in the US. So the lines don't match up and something's happening. Women are not either joining the workforce, staying in the workforce and advancing in the workforce. And this is really in the AAMC's most recent uh, survey showing that despite the fact we have a lot of women coming in in the medical school uh, level, they're not advancing along the way. So you can see here going from left to right medical school, medical school graduates, residents, faculty, and then when you get to the leadership positions, there's a steep drop off. Division chiefs, those who achieve full professorship, and then ultimately receive those major leadership positions either nationally or locally as deans or department chairs. Uh, this is, looks even worse for underrepresented minorities. So when you look at the American population, a little over a third uh, are underrepresented minorities, but when you actually look at the pie of physicians, over 50%, are white with only 5% Hispanic and 5% being black and African-American. When you look at medical school faculty, only 7% are underrepresented minority members. Again, looking at this, 
a little bit differently, you can see that 64, in this study, 64% of physicians are male and 56% are white. This does not look like our population. 6% of physicians are Hispanic, while that, that represents 19% of our population. 5% are black, whereas that represents 13% of our population. But the flip occurs in our advanced practice teams, our nurse practitioners and nurses, where these are represented by primarily, primarily female, with only a quarter being non-white. And the graph on the far right-hand side, again, just shows the trends over time that we have seen some increase in some minority groups, but not across the board. So what does it specifically look like in surgery? So you're not meant to be able to read this, but if you look at the very top line, that's you guys, pediatrics, good job. This is a uh, percent of women within that are within the profession. Then you have to zoom down to the very bottom of the list. And here I am, thoracic surgery. We've got a ways to go. When you look at it differently in this, looking at uh, specialty societies, so the second to the bottom of line is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Looking over a decade, there's been a doubling of the number of trainees who are in the society, a quadrupling of female society members. But again, when you look at those leadership positions up until recently, 0% in executive positions. Thankfully this year, the AATS has enjoyed having Yolanda Colson as the first female president of their association and the STS will follow next year. I love this study. So this looks at gender gaps within surgical specialties. So specifically, if you look at this lower portion here where you look at plastics, urology, orthopedic surgery, and neurosurgery, which are fields that are highly male dominated, specifically if we focus on orthopedic surgery. So the percent of women change over a decade went from 12% to 15%. If you go over here, that means that in, if you look at orthopedic surgery here, the teal line is the number of years at the current rate of growth that orthopedic surgery will need to have the same representation of their trainees being female as a general population. And that is 117 years. So incredible. We need to do something faster than just letting things grow at the current rate. So what are some facts about women in surgery? Women in surgeries tend to marry individuals with the same or a higher level of education. 90% of female residents are in a dual career household and 50% of them are married to another physician. So that means they have two challenging schedules to navigate at home. In general surgery, 38% of the residents are women and only 18% of the faculty are women. And the female attrition rate within surgical residencies is 25%. It's been shown that female surgeons invest nearly twice as many hours and miss more activities at work compared to their male counterparts because of their parenting obligations. When you look at the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, this looks like a really great slide. If you look at the uh, bottom here, 1961, that is when Nina Star Brownwald received her board certification. And there's been steady continual growth within the number of diplomates that are women that are board certified. However, when you look at 1999, that meant that women represented 1% of board certified thoracic surgeons. And a decade later, that only got up to 4%. There are many barriers that are reported for women in surgery. These include the significant implicit and explicit biases against female surgeons that remain prevalent within the workforce. And we'll get to microaggressions a little bit later, but these are pervasive and wear heavily on women. Female surgeons are globally underrepresented in leadership positions and senior academic ranking positions, have been often hankered, uh, hampered by the lack of effective mentorship. There's often this perception that a woman needs a woman to be their mentor. They don't need that. They need a mentor who's going to sponsor them. The two female physicians that I know that are most successful in congenital heart surgery are myself and Stephanie Fuller, and we were both were mentored and sponsored by a male surgeon, and we credit our careers to those two individuals. In general, female surgeons are less likely to be married and less likely to have children, and we are certainly financially undercompensated compared to our male counterparts, and we'll get to some of that data in a moment as well. So how does it look in pediatrics? You guys have made a lot more progress than surgery when you look at the numbers. So the percent of women faculty over from 1990 to 2019, over two decades, dramatic increase in women within your profession. However, the same problem exists in terms of the pipeline. When you look here in terms of women going from trainees to deans, in medicine in the blue line and pediatrics in the green line, you certainly are outperforming the overall field of medicine. But still, as we get to these higher positions, women are underrepresented. And this continues to persist in both 
editorial board positions, authorship, as well as participation in societies and committees. The same holds true for underrepresented minorities within pediatrics. Again, when you look at the rate of growth over two decades in the overall field of medicine, the uh, field of pediatrics has done well, but still many of these groups are far underrepresented compared to the representation within our society. And then we get to pediatric cardiology. This is a survey that uh, SOMIA led that was recently published that was a survey sent out to all division directors with an excellent response rate. And it showed that there's similar trends to pediatrics, but more notable, and I think this probably holds tr true for most of the specialties within pediatrics, which again, subspecialties tend to trend more with some of the procedural specialties, where there again are more women entering into pediatric cardiology, but as they advance through academic ranks into leadership positions, there's certainly a lack. These uh, trends also, there's near parity in those early career faculty, but those who are advanced along a tenure track also is underrepresented, especially when you get to the professor level. <clears throat> and this is um, also similar in terms of underrepresented minorities where there's a staggering low representation of those individuals, again, across all levels of pediatric cardiology. And then there's the sticky stuff. Um, there's a couple of great talks that are out there about sticky floors and glass ceilings. So the sticky stuff is the stuff that makes us hard to push forward as underrepresented minorities or women. These are issues of imposter phenomenon, feeling inadequate, feeling like you, you're not eligible or should be considered for, a, for an advanced position, applying for those positions. Inequities that exist in terms of awarding different fellowships, opportunities, scholarships, early career development awards, promotion, leadership opportunities, opportunities to speak publicly, grants, and then there's the emotional exhaustion. So always challenging in terms of being a care provider, whether it's for your children at home or for your elder parents as you get older, the challenges of parenting within the medical profession, as well as the pervasive microaggressions. And then there's the effect of the COVID pandemic. This was significant. I think we all saw that all of a sudden what we hid behind um, closed doors at home or the challenges of balance and everything suddenly became very public when we were on camera and having, you know, kid have a meltdown in the background and you forgot to hit mute or as I was sharing, you know, when your kid's like, can you wipe me and the camera's not off. And, uh, but, you know, it really became apparent that during the pandemic, women were not succeeding academically like men were. We saw in the annals of thoracic surgery where I'm a deputy editor, the number of submissions was off the charts. Men published tremendously during the pandemic where women's publications fell off because all of a sudden those secondary responsibilities, those uh, family responsibilities became much more prevalent. So this is where we're gonna start talking about the uncomfortable stuff, it's compensation. This is a super busy slide. All you need to know is anything to the left is where women are being paid less than men. And this is all sorts of different specialties. The dark teal is when you're first hired and the lighter bars are when 10 years later. And the bottom line is this looked at 55,000 academic positions. Women start at lower salaries, have a low mean annual growth rate, have a lower year, 10 year earning potential, and one year delay in being promoted from say assistant to associate professor costs you $26,000 on average. Failure to be promoted reduced earning potential overall by $218,000. So when you look at, there's a lot of different components that go into compensation and each single bucket, there is an element of bias that plays into how salaries are considered. So if you look at total cash compensation, your base salary negotiation penalty. So if most female physicians are married and have some of a similar uh, career position, they've got you. If that spouse has a job, you can't negotiate. They're not, no, you're not gonna go to another institution. Um, looking at rank and seniority, you know, Maybe you weren't so pleasant one day in the ICU and that's perceived as different than my male colleagues who throw knives in the OR. And that's a negative performance evaluation and how you're gonna be compensated. Productivity, if you have more domestic activities, you maybe are publishing less or women tend to contribute more in organizational activities, supporting internal programs that may not get you published, but help move a program forward, but you don't get credit for those things. And then leadership premium. You're not given an opportunity to have a national leadership position. You don't have that national prevalent prominence that gets an extra bump in your pay. So cents on the dollar, what are we worth? When you look at white women, black women, Asian women, we all are similarly undervalued 
and this impacts 60,000 physicians a year. The pay gap that's based on gender in medicine is one of the largest pay gaps in the overall US labor markets. There's a second gen, uh, generation gender bias that involves prejudices that are embedded in our unconscious beliefs and what a leader should look like, how men and women should behave, and how women work is assigned and valued. And here's something for you guys to all think about. There's an interesting phenomenon in US labor markets that there's a loss of prestige and decline in earnings that occur as a field becomes heavily populated with women. So for example, if you look at average salaries, Internal medicine and pediatrics are both three-year training programs. You do similar work in just different age brackets. Why are pediatricians compensated less than internal medicine physicians? And then negotiation. It actually turns out women are pretty good at negotiating. It's just we're perceived as less hireable. And the traits that we are judged on are high, heavily weighted on different performance measures than men. So this was one of these talks that left a room silent at the STS, I shamelessly stole some of Sherry's slides. Sherry Erickman is, an, is a cardiothoracic surgeon. And this was a workforce study looking at compensation within cardiothoracic surgery. So what you're paid is what you're worth. When you look at the US, women are getting better compensated from 60% to 83%. But the bottom line is, is in the US, women are viewed as being worth 83% less than men. And interestingly, as we advance, we're worth less. As we do more, we are valued less. So when you look at academic cardiothoracic surgeons, as you advance through the academic ranks, you will be compensated less. You will be worth less to your program. So if you think about now, most uh, house officer associations are now unionized. You wouldn't ever think of paying your chief resident, your female resident, less than your male chief resident. That would be really hard to get that to be passed through. But when your female chief resident graduates, the next day, she is valued less than that man. And she will be valued less for the rest of her career. So again, in cardiothoracic surgery, when you look specifically at the higher levels, if you're a female professor, you earned 90% of the salary of male associate professors. Female chiefs earn 98% of their male professors, whereas male chiefs, earn 128% salary of male professors. So when you look at this kind of in how this works out in a calendar, the equal payday concept. So a man, what he earned at the end of 2022, what's on his W-2, a woman needs to continue to work through the month of January, the month of February, and through half the month of March to make the same amount of money as that man made in 2022. But meanwhile, that man in 2022 has now made two and a half months of salary while you're still trying to play catch up. And this results in accumulated wealth. This is real money. This is how you repay your medical loans. This is interest payments, paying your home, college tuition for your children, investing in your retirement. And when you look at the blue is the average timeline for men. It looks like, isn't that amazing? They just kind of march along at a normal pace, assistant, associate, full. Women are held back at the assistant and associate level. And what this results in is in the end, based on differential in pay, as well as difference in advancement, is that over the course of a career, the average female cardiothoracic surgeon is going to make $6 million less than her male counterpart with the same amount of training, same amount of work. So there's lots of different areas where we can start focusing and start the conversation. They're having meetings like this where we have raised awareness at an institutional level, having promotion and compensation committees where there's transparency in terms of salary. People, men are more likely to play the game, looking for a job, threatening to leave, getting a bump in pay, but their female counterparts don't get the same. And we often don't have that ability to negotiate like that. Working at our society levels, again, trying to improve uh, transparency, doing surveys like this, creating guidelines, transparency as to how salaries are negotiated, and then more in the global environment, continuing to disseminate effective strategies of how we can mitigate this. So this gets to promotion. So again, when you look at advancement, busy slide, but what you need to look at is basically here, male versus female, and then here are our underrepresented minorities. Compared to men, women are advanced more slowly from associate to assistant to associate, as well as our underrepresented minorities. And this also holds true male, female, as well as underrepresented minorities at the associate to full professor level. 
Overall, clinical departments had lower promotion rates than basic science. There are lower promotion ranks from assistant to associate professor for women than men. This, however, this difference shrinks as you move along. And again, our underrepresented minorities are also promoted at a slower rate. So there are many things we can do to move forward. This includes for those of us who are actively involved in medical journals, making sure that women are represented on the editorial boards, looking at term appointments to give other people opportunities. There's certainly a lot of times where your term keeps getting added on. I think I've been the deputy editor now for well over a decade of annals of thoracic surgery, <laughs> and I'm ready to move on. But also the peer review process. You are judged on the institution you're in. You're judged on your name. We all that is present within how a manuscript is reviewed. When you think about how you know symphonies interview or candidates where they walk on the stage shoeless, so you can't tell a male from a woman. In terms of society, conscious attempts to promote women and underrepresented minorities to leadership positions, improving representation at moderator panels is something we actively look at at all of our national meetings to make sure we have equal representation. And also at the university levels, transparency in terms of promotion, how people are promoted and what are the keys to promotion, compensation and recognition for citizenship. And really this is kind of an ongoing process. It's not a, we do it once and it's done. We need to continually examine where the issues are in terms of equity and diversity, make sure that we are transparent with what, where we are and where we want to go, continue to investigate what is involved, implement strategies, track how we're doing, disseminate those results to other groups and continue that feedback loop. So there are several steps forward in terms of this, and especially in terms of how we equate what individuals work and what their activities are. So there's stage specific strategies for advancement that look at individual pathways, those people who step away for parenting responsibilities or other things. Examine what the barriers are and allow flexibility. Some of this goes into training now where there's some flexibility in start and stop dates if people take time off for having children. Using career coaching and time banking systems that allow for flexibility and wellness amongst our members. And then the Mayo Clinic created this new kind of digital scholarship concept where there's a lot of activity that women are doing that may not be published in our journals, but is active within our social media and other metrics of how they're contributing to the society. So what are some of the workplace challenges? So microaggression, I think we all actually know what this feels like, but have a hard time putting words around it. But this, these are indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group. These are subtle acts of exclusion. And there's four different types of microaggression. So the top one, microassault is an unconscious, it's kind of the old fashioned discrimination. This is when somebody looks at you and says, wow, they let women be doctors now. A micro insult are those unconscious demeaning messages about an aspect of a person's identity. This is when you're confused as a janitor or the interpreter or nurse. Micro invalidations are those unconscious exclusions and dismissals of a recipient's feelings and thoughts. And this is when somebody thinks they're being like thoughtful and they say, oh, I'm colorblind and realizing that, you know, that's part of your journey is part of your experience. Or this is a meritocracy, meaning you're only gonna look at what you have accomplished and not gonna look at what your challenges and barriers were to those accomplishments. Oops. And then there are the environmental microaggressions. These are macro level. This is an inequitable application of promotion and compensation plans, lack of breastfeeding rooms or childcare at national conferences. And I thought this would be uh, apropos for today. I think many of you probably saw the social media mail storm over the new general surgery residency class coming in where a really just kind welcome to the family tweet was put out about this lovely group of individuals who have worked incredibly hard. And you know, I think many of us look at that picture and want to pause and say, oh, wow, there's just one guy. And 20 years ago, the same picture probably would have been all men with one woman. One woman. But what happened and the things that were said and the judgments that were made about these individuals and their performance and their value of being in these positions will forever probably be in these people's minds. They'll never forget it. That's blatant bullying, bias, and microaggressions. So how do we recognize microaggressions within our field? These are verbal and nonverbal reminders of how women and underrepresented minorities are different from what we consider our stereotypical male physician. These are insidious, and hard to get those who are unaffected to understand. So this is when something is said, and it hits you to the core and the person standing right next to you is like completely oblivious. And it's not to mean that they're a bad person or you are overly sensitive. You have a different journey, you have a different story. So different things impact you differently. 
but these are some of the heftiest burdens within the medical profession. These are daily, repetitive, um, and really are more uh, impactful than overt bullying. There's clear links to microaggressions with depression, anxiety, trauma, as well as physical conditions such as hypertension. Effective mechanisms that are very helpful are creating social networks, sponsorship, and mentoring. I heard a lot in the last day from the women within pediatric cardiology who have banded together with an early career group and a mid-career group and how much they have found support within each other and being able to talk openly about different issues. And I think that's incredible. And really the key when you, these things happen is how do you respond to them? And I think it used to be that we just kind of shrug it off and let it go, but really it's important to acknowledge when they've happened and speak in the moment and realize that as a bystander or as a friend, you speaking up, not defending the person, but speaking up to the, the event, to the act and acknowledging that it's inappropriate, why it's inappropriate, why it's hurtful and how it could be done differently. So there's all sorts of acronyms that you can use for mechanisms to address microaggression. I like this one, Brett. And actually I was talking to another female surgeon this past weekend and um, she paused, she's like, you know why I wear pearls in the operating room and not diamonds? I was like, never really given that much thought. Pearls are made from grit, diamonds are made from pressure. So I wore my pearls today. So anyway, when you, in these events of microaggression, first, gather your thoughts, pause, do not react emotionally or with anger. Be understanding that that person may not really have had ill intent, they just need to be educated. Restate what you heard. Ask the speaker to restate their comment. Give them the opportunity to clarify because perhaps they didn't say it the way they had initially wanted to. Dig a little deeper and seek clarification. Help me understand what you meant by that comment. And talk it out. Discuss how it potentially impacted you or others and help them understand how that could be avoided in the future. Um, other uh, microaggressions, this is a, uh, Looking at female-female communication interactions within the medical system, I think this is something many of us have experienced. I know throughout my career, I've been repeatedly told that when I say there are gender differences in how women interact or behaviors are perceived, and I've been repeatedly told by my male senior colleagues that that's not true, it's just you. And that's crushing, and over a career, it basically crushes your soul. Um, so there's now thankfully data out there that when somebody says that you can show it to them. So female physicians feel they do not receive the same level of assistance or respect from female nurses. Female physicians feel they have difficulty communicating with nurses more so than their male counterparts. Nurses are more likely to refer to a female physician by their first name rather than as doctor. They often require more explanation for their medical decision-making. Two thirds of female physicians reported challenging relationships with nurses, whereas most male physicians said they had no issues. On the flip side, interestingly, nurses actually feel less intimidated by female physicians and felt they were more autonomous. So it's this interesting dichotomy on how the relationship is perceived. And ultimately phys female physicians felt they were more likely to have their tone analyzed or to be labeled as difficult based on these interactions. And this is not a Gray's Anatomy book, Sex and Medicine. It's a great book that goes into, really delves into a lot of these dyad interactions and how gender plays significantly and how we interact every day in a very hierarchical society. So the next couple of slides are about a survey I did with Raina Sinha, who's a female congenital heart surgeon who did two different surveys, really kind of looking at the status of women in congenital heart surgery. And we are really in a bit of crisis. Um, we were talking about this last night. I think there's like 18 or 19 of us in the country now, and there's about a 50% failure to launch rate. So women who fail to go beyond that first phase of their career and get promoted and stay in the field. So something is happening. So this was a qualitative survey of many components. And you can see there's a lot of negative attributes, feeling that they weren't supported, issues of sexual harassment, feeling they didn't have enough mentors, uh, lack of male colleagues, feeling that they were perceived uh, differently based on their gender in ICU and OR meetings. And that many of them had to do uh, challenges within their personal lives of living apart from a spouse due to job availability, the impact of childbearing on their career and the impact of their marital status. And many have considered leaving the field. But most importantly, despite all this, most of them said that they mentor other women who are interested in the field 
and would continue to encourage other women to seek a career in congenital heart surgery. But this is the most sobering. 65% of female congenital heart surgeons have been sexually harassed, and the majority of the perpetrators are a staff surgeon. 82% perceive gender pay disparity. When the survey was then done, including men and women congenital heart surgeons, uh, you can see when you bear it out across levels, so two key points. The median age of graduation was the same. So the argument, well, those are more senior male surgeons. So that's why they're at higher rank. Um, doesn't hold true. And actually, three quarters of the female surgeons had additional secondary degrees beyond MD compared to their male counterparts. So more educated, same time of graduation, slower to be promoted to higher levels. And as you can see on the far left hand, at the higher levels of uh, status, significant pay differentials. And then when you drill down more, there's a lot of things that are statistically significant on, along the way here. And this has to do with lack of mentorship, um, being negatively perceived, and salary issues, um, feeling that uh, their family life negatively impacted their training, having the majority of women, more women had to live apart from their spouses, fewer women have children, um, they, more women perceive challenges and uh, obtaining leadership positions within the field. And most importantly, nearly 60% of women considered leaving the field compared to 30% of men. So there are many issues that are important within uh, the experience for women, specifically within this field, but from a training perspective, the pervasive sexual harassment, both in training and as faculty surgeons, differentials in salary and academic potentials, workplace gender bias and how we are perceived and uh, treated by our male colleagues challenges within our personal life, as well as lower career satisfaction. And this, I give Dr. David Barron, he's a head congenital heart surgeon at Toronto Sick Kids for his commentary. And some comments from that is this is essential and uncomfortable reading for all. There's irrefutable evidence of discrimination and sexual harassment within the workplace of today that is utterly unacceptable. And critics counter such statements by saying that career progression and promotion is simply merit-based but the evidence presented here suggests that female surgeons have entirely equivalent, if not better training resumes with identical academic qualifications. Sadly, this is from two and a half years ago now, and I'm still the lowest paid congenital heart surgeon at my level. So work-life integration. So this gets to, I'm gonna really focus on from the surgical perspective, but there are challenges for uh, women in our profession and how they balance everything. So this was a survey of cardiothoracic surgeons taking an in-training exam. Not surprisingly, there was no difference between men and women in terms of what fields they were interested in. They wanted to have an academic or private practice, their interest in pursuing additional training or their overall career satisfaction. But women were less likely to be married, less likely to have children, and were less likely to perform research in their careers. This was a study done by Shanda Blackman looking at uh, birth trends amongst cardiothoracic surgeons. I've highlighted some of the key issues. Not surprisingly, there's really no difference between men and women cardiothoracic surgeons in terms of their desire to have children. However, far more women delayed having children due to their career, and far more women felt that having children adversely affected their career. And this is something that's pervasive across uh, medicine the need for assisted reproductive technology. Infertility is twice as high within the medical profession than in the general population. And certainly delaying childbearing doesn't help. Erica Rangel, I think this was like the hashtag me too moment for medicine uh, when this came out in the New York Times. She's a general surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital and she's published widely on many of these uh, gender related issues, especially in the field of surgery. And in her study, she found that nearly 40% of pregnant surgery residents considered leaving their residency. And she was quoted as saying, I felt like I wasn't a great mom or partner or residency or, or um, position. And so she's done a series of surveys. I'm not gonna go through all these details in the interest of time. Um, but in this survey, basically looking at surgical residents who had at least one pregnancy during their training, the majority, almost 90%, worked an unmodified schedule up until the birth of their child. Nearly 80% took less than six weeks of maternity leave and felt that the duration was inadequate and felt that their board restrictions were the major barrier. Not surprising, the majority felt that breastfeeding was important 
but also almost 90% felt uncomfortable to ask attending surgeons permissions to step away. And certainly talking to women yesterday, stories of the challenges of breastfeeding and going from first baby to second baby where you care a little less what people think, um, but it's, it's notable. The majority wish that they'd had greater mentorship in terms of how to integrate their family and their career. And many witnessed uh, negative comments by their peers. But again, most importantly, 40% considered leaving a profession that they had been committed to for the years leading up to that. And 30% would discourage female medical students from uh, pursuing a field in a career in surgery. And then, you know, it's not just even the uh, uh, maternity leave, it's the perinatal element, the pre the um, the period of time during pregnancy. And there's a lot of data showing significantly higher rates of uh, obstetrical complications for both medical and surgical residents. So if you look at the top line, rate of miscarriage is nearly three times the national average. Placental abruption higher than the national average. IUGR, I talked to some people yesterday about IUGR. I mean, I was so proud of myself of the picture of me wearing my scrubs the day I went in for my induction for my little 10 percentile little son with IUGR because I worked too many hours. Um, and here, if you look at this bottom panel, simply taking more than six night calls per month significantly increased the rate of significant obstetrical complications, as well as simply operating more than eight hours per week. So for a cardiothoracic surgeon, that's a good day. <laughs> This was a Danish study looking at uh, night work and miscarriage. This was really interesting. So if women who worked two or more night shifts had an increased risk of miscarriage after pregnancy, um, after week eight, and the cumulative number of night shifts between weeks three and 21 had a dose dependent pattern effect on miscarriage rates. But yet, you know, up until recently, the goal of a pregnant resident was to make up all their call before they went on maternity leave. So when they came back, you could take all the extra calls so that nobody missed that they were gone. But the good thing is, is now we're kind of getting a little equity here. And there's a lot of talk now about paternity leave and what we do for our male residents. And I think this has been a huge equalizer in the field in terms of now it's a shared benefit. Not only are the women taking time off to be with their families, the men are taking time off to be with their families and has made a tremendous difference. And this is a study looking at, you know, some of the male perceptions. So so male residents perceived a significant stigma if they wanted to take their paternity leave. And quite often this is now written into house officer policies. They get six to 10 weeks of paternity leave. They don't feel like they can take the benefit. They still felt a huge burden of guilt re related to asking others to cover them. And most importantly, male residents felt they had little mentorship or role models on a success successful work-life integration. I think now our female residents enjoy the fact there are women in the profession who are balancing it all and they're kind of showing a little bit of the dirty laundry of how it all gets done. But, you know, for our male, male trainees who see the, especially in the field of surgery where, you know, you're really dedicated if you show up every single day and you sit in your office Saturday and Sunday morning and you watch the baseball game on your computer rather than sitting at home and watching, going to a baseball game with your kid. So it's really incumbent upon the senior men to provide a good example for our male trainees. But I know talking to our residents now who we have a very inclusive 12 weeks of maternity or paternity leave, that it's no longer an issue for people to take time off. The men love having that time with their families. They're more than happy to cover for their female colleagues and vice versa because they're both are enjoying the same benefit. So to wrap up the current state, we've got a lot of challenges that are before us. Post-pandemic life is different and it's never gonna go back to the same. We've had a little bit of a work-life reset in terms of we all actually suddenly had a time to be at home and make dinner for our families, take our kids to school. And we realized that it is possible to do some of the things that we used to think had to be done in person can be done virtually. But we're also trying to redefine our boundaries. You know, it's, it's to the point that, yeah, you can do things virtually, but if you're always on a Zoom call when you're driving your kid to school, I mean, my kids are now could be board certified cardiothoracic surgeons. But, you know, is that the spending meaningful time with them? The environment is increasingly challenging. When you look across the country, 56% of academic medical centers are expected to be in the red this year. Much of this has been the crippling effect of nursing contracts and the nursing shortage that happened during the pandemic. The people that are bearing that burden are the physicians. We are the ones that are filling the gap. We are the ones that are facing restrictions and what we can do 
and how we can be compensated because of that. And we continue to experience every day the staffing and supply shortages become a common theme in the operating room where you know they just hand you whatever cannula like, sorry, we don't have one that's the right size for your patient. Good luck. <laughs> or, you know, can you splice out these four pieces of the bypass circuit because we don't have them right now and you just have to deal with it. I know talking to the group here with shortages this summer, they're just sh shutting down part of the practice this summer because they can't staff beds. This is affecting all of us and it affects when you have to cancel your cases during the day and have to reschedule your whole life and your kid's life because now you can't do what you had set out to do, not to mention the impact on patients and families. And most importantly, this has become an incredibly polarized world. I personally try my best to never get on social media, just living through what we have done with the STS and our DI challenge from our presidential address. There are widely different passionately held opinions on this topic that are challenging and make it even more uncomfortable to have these conversations. But I think with education, making clear what we're talking about and what we're not talking about is important. We're not talking about affirmative action. We are talking about fairness. We're talking about equity and we're talking about making sure that we have the best talent available in our field. So in the end, I, the pipes are leaking. They're leaking a lot. And I think it's just gonna get worse before it gets better because we're seeing so much stress and burnout within our field. The bottom line is I think we're doing a great job attracting women and underrepresented minorities to the field of medicine. My inbox is full every day of emails from female high school students, college students, medical students. Can I talk to you? I wanna hear about your career. I'm excited about your career. Coming and shouting, people are excited and enthusiastic, but we need to keep that enthusiasm. They can't walk in and then say, well, wait a minute. Why don't I see somebody who's happy at the other end? Why don't I see people who are succeeding at the next level? Uh, again, I was talking to one of my female colleagues and she's like, it's kind of like being in an abusive relationship. For many of us women, we go out and have these opportunities, have meet lovely people who praise us for our contributions and have national leadership positions to go home and be told we can't be leaders. We don't have leadership potential. And, you know, remember that time you yelled at a nurse when you were a third year general surgery resident, um, it, it's hard. There's been a uh, lack of promotion within, and workplace challenges persist. There's uh, inequities that are gonna continue to lead to attrition. You know, many people are leaving the field because of the challenges of compensation or being able to balance their work and life. When we did a recent survey of our membership, well-being was by far and away the number one issue and priority for our members. I think this is something everybody is talking about. And most interestingly, the uh, portion of our profession that was most in jeopardy was our mid-career. So those individuals, when you first come out of training, you get a job and you're excited and you are getting some opportunities, it's that next level when it's time for you to get that grant. It's time for you to get promoted to associate professor. It's time for you to start getting some leadership opportunities nationally and you're not getting there. And that's where I think people start hitting the wall. And that can be, that's both men and women. So I think these are areas where we really need to focus and making sure that those individuals can find success and move to the next level. So I think we need to continue to have uncomfortable conversations. We need to be transparent. There needs to be absolute transparency regarding salaries and promotions. So when I was finishing my training, I lockstep trained with another man for nine years, same institution, same research time. I then did an additional year of congenital heart surgery training. I had an additional board certification, the quadruple board certified, 10 years of training, congenital heart surgeon. He was hired as an assistant professor. I was hired as an instructor. I had more publications. And throughout our entire career, we're still at the same institution. He has been advanced before I, I've spent three years as an instructor and then said like, hey, can I get on the tenure track? Oh, you're not an assistant professor? Oh, I must've forgotten to put that through. So every time he got promoted, I would ask for promotion and get it. And you know, the initial explanation was, well, the medical student, does, medical school decides the metrics for how you're brought in. And there was never a thought to question the medical school's 
metrics, because how is it that we have two candidates that are so similar, but being brought in at different pay scales and different academic rank? Data will continue to inform our actual items, surveys, research, anything we can do to clearly show that there are issues and differences so we can start to move forward. And any opportunity that we can use to translate this into awareness and into action. So this is a slide from Somia, you know, two amazing luminary women. But the bottom line is our world should be equipped the next generation of women to outdo us in every field. And this will be our legacy that we leave behind. So I thank you for your attention. Um, all really great questions. And I, I think one of the things is, as I've shared with others, I had my children quite late in life. So I had got tenure when I gave birth to my first son. Um, so I was in a bit of a better negotiating position, but I think this is where the women who have gone before need to step up for the women who are coming to make these things clear. Um, I went part-time, which basically meant I got paid part-time for four years of my career. Um, when they graph out my surgical volume, it never changed, whether I took three months of maternity leave in a year, whether I was working part-time or full-time. Uh, but that means you're doing a lot of work after hours that you're not being acknowledged or compensated for. And so I think having open conversations about that, and this is where some of these secondary models of looking at how do you equate somebody's value that isn't just based on an RVU. Yeah, there's actually a lot of different studies out there showing that um, female physician, female surgeon communication in the operating room leads to improved outcomes in terms of how team structures and dealing with acute um, challenging situations. Um, absolutely, women have been shown to have better outcomes in terms of, again, a lot of it is based on their relationship with patients and navigating tough situations. Um, I think some of this gets to changing the models that we use for how we calculate value. I mean, RVU is the most ridiculous random. They send a survey out every five years and say, so how hard is this compared to this? And not realizing that, you know, there's a lot that goes into doing something than just that moment of care within the operating room. Um, we have seen it in the American Board of Thoracic Surgery in our oral exams, women outperform men across the board. Um, so it's women's performance is at a high level. But again, they also, they may not be going to the lab to do research or publish a paper. They may be a program director that doesn't get the same credit, but takes a lot of time to mentorship, mentor the next level. And how do we start putting a value? Our pediatric cardiology group tried to do this of like, basically, how do you put little portions of an FTE to all these different activities that really positively impact, impact the medical institution, but don't necessarily impact the bottom line? Hi, thank you so much. My name is Olya Kolaris. I'm a pediatric nephrologist here. Um, very wonderful presentation, eye-opening. And I just wanted to ask, it's about surgery, right? So do you think that they, this data readily translates to other specialties like pediatrics, non-surgical specialties? I think so, because really, I mean, especially the subspecialties, and I think that was the thing that has been so eye-opening. I am like the one surgeon on our Control Heart Center advanced group that Somia leads. And it was really interesting to see how much the data from pediatric cardio cardiology beautifully overlaid with that that we see in surgery. So I, I think it does apply. And you know, the issue of actually having differential and a decrease in value for female dominated fields. Um, so when you look at pediatrics as especially overall, you know, that pervades all the subspecialties as well. You know, obviously there are some issues in terms of work hour and day structure that are a little bit different for uh, specialists. And I think obviously the RVU that we generate per moment in time is different because of the higher acuity intensity of time in the operating room versus clinic time and other activities. So that does probably amplify some of it to some degree, but it probably actually makes it even more glaringly apparent how much those other non-RVU generating activities are valued. I think it's a little bit of both because I think to some degree, when you get frustrated, 
some of our not best qualities come out because when you feel like you have no voice and you feel like you have to resort to just stomping your feet, it's not very effective, but sometimes it feels really good. Um, I, I personally have benefited greatly from executive coaching. And I think specifically for women, I think having coaching to get a better sense of how we are perceived and how to effectively use our leadership skills that are different to our benefit, not our detriment. Um, because women, men and women just have different styles. That's normal and that's to be anticipated. But I think there's an artificial value. So one of the things that people are working on within surgery is just the, the letter of recommendation. You know, the words that are used to describe an effective man, if you just simply change the name on that letter to a female specific name has a very different connotation. And there's good research for that. And, you know, how do we remove some of those qualifiers that are gender biased and how they can be perceived about somebody's performance. Cause I think that's a huge component of it. Um, but I think also as we have more women in leadership positions who can say, you know what, that's really not a valid concern. Or, you know, when somebody gets sent to the office of clinical affairs for something to be like, okay, this, this isn't a valid complaint. How do we work through this? How do we better understand this um, versus, you know, a male dominated world where it's this kind of zero, tolerance where again, I, I didn't realize, but when I get really quiet, if I get really stressed in the hour, I get really quiet. And that is perceived as screaming by my colleagues. And I didn't realize that. So I had to be very conscious to, once I learned that, to be like, you know, I'm really worried about X, Y, or Z, and then going into my hole, <laughs> but making it clear why I was going in the hole. But meanwhile, like, again, male colleagues throwing knives and instruments was perceived as, oh, the case is getting difficult. So understanding that different paradigm, but thankfully having somebody who's willing to have a conversation with me rather than just say, she's difficult. Rather than like, These, this is how to work with it. So literally I worked with my um, scrub tech. I was like, when you, cause she had a good, she had a good sense of me. She's like, I can see when you're going in your hole. And so we had a little signal. <laughs> Of she would like just put her hand on my arm gently. It was like, you know, you're going in your hole. Just let everybody know on your way down. And it was hugely impactful with how I was perceived. But having somebody who was willing to work with me and help me through it. Well, I think this is having male leadership that embraces this as an important topic. Um, you know, I. It's very interesting being the first female sitting at the executive meetings for the STS and Tom McGilvery, who's the current sitting president, I adore. And he has been so open. And, you know, we, after Sherry Erkman's presentation and I brought it up on our next leadership call, he's like, this absolutely cannot continue. And this needs to be our initiative. And similarly, you know, I brought up doing a fertility survey uh, nationally, and this was really important. He's like, Absolutely. He's like, not only are we going to do the survey, we're going to make a plenary session on this at the next meeting. And so it's those individuals being open minded and making this a priority, but similarly, also not taking advantage of the system. So, you know, speaking up. So when you go for that job and to, you know, play the game and you come back as you're not being appropriately compensated, look to all your peers and collectively bargain for everyone, not just yourself. Um, I, I think basically, I think because there are more women in this field, we've been able to have a bit more of a voice. I think there's a safety because there's more women, but I think this is as much, if not a larger problem for other underrepresented minorities who feel like they have less of a voice or less of an advocacy base. So I think we're at nine o'clock, so I don't want to hold people from their jobs, but thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.